My name is Hector Amaya. I'm Associate Professor of Media Studies at University of Virginia. I specialize on issues of uh, transnationalism, Latinos, and Latin America. Uh, I've written a couple of books. Uh, the first one is about Cuba, uh, about Cuban film actually, the way that it moves from the Cuba to the US. Uh, and the second one is the one that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, before I start, I wanna thank uh, John, which is, who is not here at this moment, but he will trickle in later on. And uh, the uh, Chicano uh, Studies Research, Research Center for allowing me to be here and share my ideas with you guys. Um, the title of my talk is Citizenship Access, Latinos, Media, and the Nation. And the topic will be the complex manner in which uh, the practices of citizenship and media converge to produce the intended or unintended consequence of foreclosing avenues for immigration reform. But before starting, I want, to, I want you to consider a couple of simple questions. Uh, what does immigration reform have to do with immigration enforcement and with media and why if so many Latinos and uh, Americans in general want immigration reform it hasn't happened. My talk will wrestle with these complex questions or perhaps my answer may be a little bit different from what you typically hear and to get some traction in reality I will be uh, developing two cases actually for you that I uh, I uh, developed extensively in my book Citizenship Access um, uh, the cover of which you have in front of you. The first case is about uh, immigration enforcement, uh, specifically detention practices and their coverage. The second case is a study of the advertising campaign that was crucial for the 2006 pro-immigration reform rallies, a case that sheds light into uh, the success or failure of immigration reform. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and I want to start with start with immigration enforcement again, and uh, which is a huge, that's hugely complex set of practices. But today I want us to talk uh, and to think about only a few key issues that coalesce around the issues of law. Uh, and this is partly because I approach the uh, subject of immigration enforcement from a social justice perspective, and I want you to keep in mind that justice is a legal category. So for both the key issues that I bring to your attention and for the media questions that I pose, I'd like you to keep in mind that this law of justice duality. Welcome there. One may very well argue for starters that immigration enforcement is always about issues of law, about the quality of the laws we have, and about the manner in which these laws are applied. The state agencies such as the Border Patrol the Justice Department, and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, typically referred to as ICE, craft and carry on policies to better apply immigration law. So the issue of the quality of enforcement is often actually uh, an issue of the quality of the laws. And so uh, what is good law? And I know this is a little bit of an obvious question, but let's start there. What produces a healthy legal culture around issues of immigration or any other issues for that matter. And I want to start in the past with Britis, uh, the Athenian leader who, and perhaps one of the first uh, discussions of the issue is, is stated, if we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all and their private differences. The French uh, author Anatole France um, in 1894, uh, with perhaps a little bit more gusto says, said, in its majestic equality, the law forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, beg in the streets, and steal loaves of bread. Article 7 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. A uh, wording that uh, perhaps sounds familiar to you because uh, resembles actually our own constitution. One can safely uh, argue that a healthy legal culture, this is true in the US or in anywhere else, is one that follows the principles of legal equality. One does do not allow exceptions. Legal principles, legal principles should be applied across the board, but in what constitutes a fundamental contradiction in US legal cultures, immigration laws are based on exceptions. 
the healthy legal principles that protect you and me do not apply to uh, for immigrants in general and undocumented immigrants in particular. When I, what am I talking about specifically? Well, contemporary legal requirements of arrest, detention, trail, and deportation are shocking in their incompatibility with legal traditions in other contexts. As legal scholar Daniel Canstrom argues, compared to criminals, non-citizens, documented or undocumented, have minimal rights. Let me give you some examples. Suppression of evidence that may have been seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment will be impossible in most cases. The non-citizen will not be read Miranda rights. The non-citizen may not even be advised that he has a right or she has a right to obtain a lawyer. Uh, the non-citizen will never have the right to appointed counsel. If she believes he has, he has been singled out, singled out due to race, religion, or political opinion, she will generally not be able to uh, raise a selective prosecution defense. The non-citizen will never have the right to a jury trial. And the list goes on. And these are not small exceptions. They betray foundational legal understandings of justice in the US. But what is even more sobering is that the bulk of these practices had lasted for decades. One may then easily argue that the immigrant as a category of people is a normalized exception within US legal traditions, just like the slaves and women used to be. How far do those exceptions reach? How far are we willing to forego the, our respect for equality in our treatment of undocumented immigrants? Let me give you a glimpse. From January 2006 to uh, August 2009, an estimated 6,000 undocumented immigrants and refugees, including 3,000 children, <laughs> were incarcerated in the Teton Hotel Correctional Center in Taylor, Texas. Not since the detention of Japanese Americans in World War II had the US government detained children en masse without criminal charges against them. Reminiscent of World War II, these shameful policies and quasi-military actions against the civilian population came at a time of perceived emergency, a post-9-11 paranoid securitization during which it has been culturally acceptable mm -hmm. to express the most xenophobic views about immigrants, in particular migrants from Latin America. Hora was a private, private medium security prison turned immigration detention center um, in 2002. Uh, its, its status changed in 2006 when uh, CCA, the owner of Hato, made a deal with ICE to begin holding families, including children. Hotel's facilities were barely changed. The administrators added extra padding, extra padding uh, to beds, uh, cribs, uh, play pens here and there. Cheaply done, the changes to the uh, facilities did not change the physical feeling of prison, something that would later be harshly criticized by activists, legal scholars, and human rights advocates. Many of these detainees were refugees who had passed already the first screening um, before uh, obtaining refugee status, and we jailed them. The rest were undocumented immigrants, families. And I must remark here and remind you that being in the United States without documents, it is not a criminal offense. It is an administrative offense that merits different standards of detention according to US legal traditions, the international to international law, and to the Charter of Human Rights. This is particularly true and relevant in the case of children, of course, for whom we have created uh, and specified particular and humane policies of detention. But lowering those standards at the time was expeditious, particularly as Hotto was uh, overseen by a government agency, ICE, set on reducing undocumented immigration uh, to a security issue aware that Hato broke human rights. ICE and Hato administrators uh, prohibited UN representatives from touring the facility. And how do we get there? How do we get here? I mean, this is the United States, uh, the, 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 the nation that in 1948 was a uh, leader in advocating for the Declaration of Human Rights. Our own Eleanor Roosevelt headed the commission that wrote it. What happened to this nation? 
that made human rights laws meaningless to so many people. Many things, of course, you know, and, and, but media are a factor, and that is my specialization, so here I am. <laughs> I argue that the majority of Americans don't care about human rights because they simply don't know when human rights are being broken in the United States. So it is partly an issue of news coverage, and it is also partly an issue of the quality of the news that we get. And let me expand a little bit on this and talk briefly about uh, the news coverage about HOTO. Was HOTO a huge story on the news? And perhaps you know the answer to this one. No. And honestly, one has to ask the question, why? In HOTO, reporters had a case of human rights laws broken. The victims were children. The essential ingredients of great reporting, dramatic reporting. Uh, I can see a Pulitzer out there. If the story had been set in, Rom in Romania or Somalia, would have eaten it up. But apparently not coming from Texas. In the years that HOTO was used to detain families, there were only 110, 110 news reports. These are almost none, by the way. Half of these reports were written by three reporters. Only 14 of these were uh, published outside Texas. And only one of these was published in a state that voted Republican in 2004. Quick important facts. The three reporters that wrote the most about Hoto were Latinos, Anabel Caray, Susan Gamboa, and Juan Castillo, and there is a lesson right there, of course. But in my view, the most important lesson was this. Almost all reports, except for those written by Juan Castillo, failed to report that these detention practices were against human rights law. They were called inhumane, they were called unjust, they were called unfair, but they were rarely called illegal. I interviewed Juan Castillo, the reporter uh, that, that actually was the exception, to learn how was it that, that he actually uh, cared about the issue in a different way. And I was curious, and the answers actually were very instructive. First of all, he was the first one reporting on the issue. He was established in Austin, and Taylor is about 30 miles from Austin. From his first report, he used the expert voice of activists and legal uh, practitioners interested in ending this detention practice and commented that the children were losing weight, getting ill, and experiencing psychological trauma, something that's not very hard to imagine. A relative rarity, Castillo left in the text several quotes referring to ISIS practices as violations to human rights. And he wrote with a relative high level of specificity about things that had to be interpreted as legal infractions, uh, such as psychological trauma, uh, lack of educational offerings, and so on. Central in his reports uh, was the American legal president of Flores versus Reno, also known as the Flores Set Settlement, which has given um, the rules by which to detain minors to the INS and later to ICE. Uh, Castillo cared about law, and, but why was he different? I still had that question. It wasn't that he was a Latino. Again, Gamboa and Garay were also Latinos. But they didn't use the same language of law. What I le learned through the interviews, though, was that Castillo had professional capital that Gamboa and Garay didn't. Important leaders from both parties uh, worked on different versions of different bills that included some path to citizenship for millions. They were all defeated. The House, on the other hand, was working on the opposite type of bill, nativist legislation that punished residents and that understood the problem of undocumented immigrants chiefly through the eyes of security. The work of several House legislators paid dividends in December 2005 when the House passed the highly restrictive and clearly nativist Sense Brenner Act. Although it was defeated in the Senate, the Sense Brenner Act became the legal symbol that would energize the pro-immigration reform rallies from January to May of 2006. And I cannot emphasize enough how exemplar of good politics these rallies were. They were a fantastic example of how access to a public, public sphere can quickly translate into some form of political citizenship. They were also a textbook example of how civil society ought to work. But rallies became also a classic example of the political quandaries faced by ethnic minorities and the ability of civil society to quickly balkanize. In short, the pro-immigration reform rallies of 2006 represent the best and also the worst of our political system. 
The rallies were the work of activist organizations and the cultural power of the Spanish language media. And I want to expand a little bit on this. Although pro-immigration reform activism had been going on for years, of course, the pro-immigrant movement gained steam after the Sensebrenner Act when Elias Bermudez, uh, fed up, began using the radio airwaves in Phoenix, Arizona to organize the first march, which was only 4,000 people in January 6, 2006. Bermudez is a Mexican immigrant uh, who had a 90-minute radio talk show uh, in which he talked about issues concerning the immigrant communities, uh, Latinos and uh, Phoenix, um, from 8.30 to 10.30 every morning, uh, weekdays. Uh, Bermudez is, uh, speaks basically about the virtues of Latino immigrants in general. His radio was, of course, a perfect platform for this type of ideas. It is a Spanish news and talk format uh, radio station. But this station was not alone, and I want to also emphasize this. Other Phoenix radio stations actually joined forces with Bermudez, uh, stations like La Nueva and Radio Campesina, which also served as vehicles to advertise Bermudez's political views on immigration and other issues. The march in January 6, 2006 succeeded. And in the weeks that follow, a number of national pro-immigration uh, organizations put together a strategic plan that included national and international goals. Uh, they would meet with President uh, of Mexico, Vicente Fox, with Latin, Amer Latin American ambassadors, and rally support from other activist organizations. They would also aggressively engage in lobbying efforts against HR 4437, called a national meeting, and organize massive mobilizations. And I said, massive. The strategy, of course, succeeded. It succeeded partly because the organizations were working hard at making so, but also because the time was right. Uh, there was so much hostility uh, against Latinos and the airwaves, and uh, the rate of hate crimes against Latinos had increased. That one can argue easily that actually our uh, very survival actually was a stake. But as importantly, it succeeded because Latinos had a vibrant media system in Spanish that advocated in behalf of immigrants, and that was key to disseminating key information about the marches and at energizing Latinos and sympathizers. And let, let me reiterate this. A social movement of this caliber cannot succeed without political arguments, with political arguments and organization alone. Uh, media has to join in. Media has to broadly disseminate ideas, popularize rhetorical positions, and ener energize large numbers of populations. Luckily for Latinos, the Spanish language radio, television, and newspapers were powerful allies. And let's talk a bit more about Latino Spanish language radio in particular, since it was so important to the success of the marches. When I'm teaching on issues of politics and media, by the way, I ask my students often, what is the most important medium for social activism? And you guys are the Twitter generation, you know, you think that everything starts and begins with Twitter. Radio is, of course, I would argue radio is the most important one. Radio is the one medium that actually is in the house of the poor, of the disenfranchised, typically the people who actually need a social movement. And this is true in the US, it is true in Myanmar, it is true in Bolivia. And the Spanish language radio has evolved, luckily, in a gigantic media system from its humble, humble beginnings in the 1920s, by the way. Right now, there are probably 900 Spanish language radio stations around the nation. And in the last decade alone, the rate of growth has been 64%, something incredible. These almost 900 Spanish language radio stations comprise a powerful resources for Latinos that was key to the successful of the marches. So here we have, okay, these Latinos, immigrants, and sympathizers wanting a share of political power and they had a thriving media system that they could use as a public sphere. These were the basic ingredients of reform, which I mentioned before. Radio shows like uh, Bermudez, Vamos a Platicar, and two hugely popular LA shows uh, like DJ, uh, like El Violín de la Mañana and El Cucuy de la Mañana joined, um, were essential to this success. These radio personalities um, joined forces with others and they all share several characteristics. They all were in the Spanish. Their shows were a mixture of morning talk show 
entertainment and local news and uh, they were extremely popular in places like here like LA and other heavily um, Latino um, places in the US which by the way which by the way tend to be the largest radio markets in the US um, these DJs actually uh, often actually stand tall uh, by Howard Stern and shows like that they actually often actually have much more uh, uh, listeners Sometimes something we don't know. Um, after January, and helped by these important radio shows, the movement quickly evolved into marches of dozens and then hundreds of thousands, involving more cities and more regions in the U.S. On March of 2006, um, there were rallies in many other cities, including uh, perhaps the first one, big one, was in Chicago with 100,000, 20,000 in Phoenix, 30,000 in Denver and even 5,000 in Charlotte, North Carolina, which, uh, South Carolina, sorry, which is always a puzzle yeah, that they manage actually 5,000 people out of it. Obviously, the big, the big uh, march was here in LA on March 25, uh, 2006, with, with, uh, and we saw between half a million and a million people actually blanket downtown LA. It was, it was incredible. It was chilling. The marches blanket uh, downtown LA, giving cultural prominence to the political struggle and providing kind of a visual evidence to the otherwise abstract census figures of the year 2000. Do you know how the largest ethnic minority look? That's how it looks, you know. National media follow and uh, local radio uh, as images of uh, the marches were seen in everywhere in the nation and front pages and newspapers and TV. But this wasn't the end. On April, uh, we saw 500,000 marching in Dallas, 100,000 in San Diego. There were marches in Los Angeles, San Jose, San Francisco, Fresno, Sacramento, Albuquerque, Dallas, El Paso, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, to name a few. All of these marches mobilized between 10,000 and 100,000. The Phoenix of Joe Arpaio saw 250,000 people marching uh, in downtown Phoenix. Yelling, si se puede. I don't know if you know who Joe Arpaio is, but I can, I can fill you in on that. <laughs> These marches culminated in a national effort to halt the national economy by stopping Latino immigrant work on May 1st, 2006. And, and that was also an extraordinary day. In Washington, D.C., a pro-immigrant uh, march uh, organized the fourth largest march in the history of the capital bringing 500,000 people to the, uh, to the National Mall. And to put it in perspective, the, the history changing, I have a dream speech by Dr. King was seen by half as many people. On May 1st, 2006, we witnessed the culmination of the immigration reform movement with one of the largest labor boycotts and one day mobilizations in US history period. Between three and five million people were active that day. It was, it was quite incredible. It is incredible to think the amount of human energy put together in the name of immigration reform, in the name of citizenship. And I think it's fair to ask why they decide for citizenship. I, I know that there are all sorts of answers to these questions, question, but perhaps no, not one, um, synthesizes better the reason than the desire to belong. Citizenship is desirable, desirable because citizenship represents membership. And who can argue against that? It is a tender fact of life, I believe, that we all want to belong, that we all want to be recognized as equals, that we all want to be identified as kin. Kinship. What a beautiful world. Word. I am your kin, you are my kin. Kin, of course, has the same um, root than the word kind, a word that refers to a set group as when we say, uh, these people are my kind. And also a word that refers to, the, to benevolence as when we say, being kind to others. So kinship, kin, and kind are wonderful words that remind us that we are predisposed to treat lovingly those who are our kind, who are our kin. Citizenship defines our political kin. One citizenship is not simply to want a label, it is also to want benevolence 
and kindness. But citizenship represents more than belonging and more than kindness. And here's where things get complicated, both with our desires for reform and with the prospect of immigration reform in the US. Citizenship is also a political mechanism that societies and nation states use to divvy up political goods. Let's use some theoretical concepts to help us think this large political picture that I'm trying to paint for you. Let's think about our political system as a political market. Not a supermarket, which by the way tends to have one owner, but more like a flea market or perhaps a stock market. And any market needs currencies. And let's say that in our large political market that there is the US, uh, different currencies so, such as votes, wealth, education, social connections can be traded with the goal of uh, accumulating political capital. With that metaphor in mind, I want you to think about citizenship. Citizenship conditions our very entrance to the political market. And it is thus crucial for political capital accumulation. To have a first class citizenship is to have first class access to the political market that is our society. Where do these properties of citizenship come from? Well, our current political system is a mixture of new and old ideas, new and old techniques for governing, new and old forms of generating social value and political worth. The notion of citizenship is both, um, is all of those things, is both old and new. It is all then that we imagine a philosophical connection to the uh, Greeks, to Athens, when we think about citizenship. This connection, connection is more than romantic, by the way. It is a connection that instructs us to reflect on the words of Plato, Aristotle, or Pericles, for that matter, as if they were the words of sages set to inspire us into a better living. We are proud of having used some Athenian ideas in our modern conceptions of citizenship. And we're often proud that we have used the notion of citizenship to organize our political market. Citizen, citizen, the inhabitant of the city, is the beginning and the end of our political and legal system. But there are always dangers when we borrow from the ancients. When thinking about citizenship, it is instructive always to remember that Athens, that marvelous city-state, depended for its survival on the slaves and on the labor and protection of those who lived outside the walls, not to mention the, the systemic disenfranchisement of women. Athens, at any given time, recognized the citizenship of only 25% only of its population. So if romantically we associate citizenship to belonging to the Greeks and to Athens, it is necessary, I believe, to remember that the majority of the political effects of citizenship were exclusionary. Is it then surprising that citizenship has exclusionary effects today? Thanks to the ancients, in our current political culture, the children of Hotto never had a chance of justice, for laws are not for them. Nativism is a foundation of the Athenian in our legal system. Because we are mistaken if we think that because we have citizenship, at least we are equal in front of the law. In fact, a dirty little secret of our political system is that most of us will never enjoy a, enjoy a first-class citizenship. Although some of us may enjoy the kindness of institution, most of us are unlikely to enjoy the political, cultural, and material benefits of having first-class citizenship, which is reserved for whom? For some who have very particular characteristics, and these characteristics are by birth. If you are female, gay, brown, black, disabled, born into poverty, born outside the US, born speaking Spanish, Cantonese, Swahili, Persian, Arab, Urdu, Tagalog, you don't have first class citizenship. And that is most of us, by the way. This is the reality of our politics. The unearned privilege of a first class citizenship are preserved for a numeric minority. A small group of people uh, who occupies the best locales for trading political wares. And if political power depends on the accumulation of political capital, 
the likeliness that a second class citizens will ever accumulate enough power to participate in governance is very, very, very small. A significant number of the birth characteristics that determine whether you can enjoy a first class citizenship are today connected to nativism, to the nativist movement which has become a political locale from which it's relatively easy to trade political wares and from which it's relatively easy to accumulate political capital. The nativists stand uh, right now is covering over our House of Representatives and over the majority of the state legislation. So it is a big, powerful tent. One may argue that clearly the political market is more complex. We do have Obama. Uh, we have uh, Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Samuel Alito. Mayor Julian Castro, and even Senator Marco Rubio. But we do not have comprehensive immigration reform. And in spite of the incredible amount of political energy and success of the 2006 marches. And marching that year with thousands in, uh, uh, in Austin, Texas, was the greatest political feeling I experienced in the US. And, but this feeling was also a very sour lesson as we witness our political system clamped down and foreclose any hope of immigration reform. Not only did comprehensive immigration reform fail, but things were actually worse for undocumented immigrants. <coughs> the border fence passed. Nativism became the ticket in states like um, Arizona, Oklahoma, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. These and other states passed draconian, worse laws that would negative, negatively affect undocumented immigrants in particular, but immigrants in, in general. Things got worse. Which brings me to the last and perhaps most crucial question. How could the efforts of millions in 2006 be defeated by the efforts of a few dozen thousand people? Thousands, perhaps. The nativist camp has always been smaller, actually, than the pro-immigration Latino camp. I believe that the big factor, if not the biggest, was that nativist voices were able to position themselves as representing consensus, were able to quickly occupy the center of the market. And this happened due to a series of interlocking mechanisms that, parallel to the exclusionary effects of citizenship, tend to position ethno-racial minorities in the least advantageous locales in the political market. Let the lessons of 2006 stay with us. Neither the might of Latino media, the size of Latino audiences, which are huge, nor the success of political organizations that brought millions out to march found correlatives in the large, at, at large US political and media cultures. Instead, English language media enfranchised the voices of nativists, amplifying their ability to speak to the majority. Not once during the months following the pro-immigration reform rallies, arguably the largest political rallies in the nation since the civil rights movement, did the national English speaking media system allow for uh, the voice of a Latino, a single Latino with the same amped, continuous, obnoxious volume given to the likes of Ludovs, Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh, Bill O'Reilly, and so on. And let me emphasize this. The muting of minority speech in this case is not about money. After all, the Spanish language media is very profitable. No, the muting was about ethnicity, our race, and our language. The US public sphere, like the US media system, is fundamentally organized along linguistic lines. The Spanish language media, which has stars, celebrities, and loud and powerful political voices gets no recognition in English language media. It is quite marginal. The Latino public sphere is it's a little bit of a ghost, and the voices of Latino media stars who represent a significant part of the Latino public sphere are almost non-existent. Should we hold on to immigration reform? Of course we should. But it's my job is to tell the my job is to tell you also the results of my research. Neither having a thriving political movement or a lively public sphere can guarantee a share of power if you are marked by otherness and if the ethno-racial markers that define you, your phenotypes, your culture, your language are considered foreign. 
why should someone from outside the walls participate in our political market? The fight over immigration is not only about undocumented immigrants, it is also centrally about Latino and Latinos and Latino power. The organizers of the marches were citizens remind you of this. And the huge majority of the marches were citizens, sympathizers, and legal residents. Most were by Latinos, many were bilingual, but a huge number were people of all races. But the issue was and is about Latino political power, and natives will not let it go. I'm talking here about the Tea Party today, which by the way uh, invites Tancredo regularly as a speaker. He was actually one of the keynote speakers in the first Tea Party con conference. This wing of, by the way, which was only 600 people. We sometimes forget. This wing of nativist radicals would not allow Congress to do their job, not, not right now at least. But the prospect of Latino power is not only feared by the Tea Party. Let me tell you uh, how I know that. Uh, in April 2010, after um, Arizona Governor Chandler signed what at the time was the worst immigration bill in the nation. The law order, you know, you know which one I'm talking about. Eh? Opponents of the law argue that um, the law would inevitably lead to uh, discrimination, racial profiling against Latinos. You remember that too. On May 2010, a few months after uh, the law had passed, Cunipia University Polling Institute, one of the prime polling institutes in the nation, released data showing that a majority of voters in the nation wanted similar, similar laws passed in their own states. The support for this type of legislation came despite the fact that the majority also recognized that it would lead to discrimination against Latinos. Tellingly, the majority of blacks and Latinos oppose the passing of those state measures in their own states, by the way. Here, a wide majority define the nation state decisively and undisputably in ethno-racial terms, and embrace political and legal excess as a proper privilege of white citizenship. Yes, the white, the white majority said at the time, we can live with their discrimination. Before I asked, how could the efforts of millions be stopped by the efforts of thousands? Inspired by events like those in Arizona and here in LA, and by the outcome of the immigration rallies, Today I want to introduce the term citizenship access, a theoretical tool um, that can help us explain how the thousands can defeat, defeat the millions and how the children of Otto will never receive justice. Citizenship access theorizes that citizenship is inherently, inherently a process of uneven political ac capital accumulation and that the unevenness follows ethno-racial lines. This theory helps us see that excess happens when those in power can organize political markets in such a way that political accumulation yields a surplus value that they accumulate. The accumulation of such surplus political value over time becomes the basis for more and for easier accumulation. I call this theory citizenship excess because it is the citizen who is the political actor within the nation state because citizenship is how we articulate our relationship to the state, and therefore citizenship and its excess is how we express ethno-racial supremacy. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, of course I'm here for questions if you have any. Yes. I wasn't here at the time in the U.S. at the time of those uh, protests. Uh -huh. But I, I, you know, I saw the movie uh, without a Mexican, uh -huh. um, and I was wondering um, why they didn't decide to go longer, because I think the um, the impact of a, of a strike by immigrants um, just for one day wouldn't really be felt. But I think it, it, you know if. If there was like a long-term withdrawal of immigrant labor in, in the economy, you would see more of an effect. You would see th th things getting really very dirty, and, um, and I think maybe the political impact of that sort of mobilization would be much stronger. Um, I mean, is it just because the people 
those people that are, um, if those immigrants live so close to um, the margins of, of, of survival, that it would be like very dangerous for them? Would there be no source of financial support for them to sustain a kind of massive strike where they maybe they fear the retaliation that would result would be like mass deportations and they would just pull in other people. Um, and the second thing is I'm wondering like what the effect of that because that time was the economy was doing pretty well mm -hmm. at that time and like how that might be different if for example it was in 2008 or if we could go into a recession <coughs> soon if the effect would be different if they pulled such a, um, a tactic at the time when the economy was not doing well what would have more of a political effect. Yeah, or less. Uh, it, is, it is hard to tell. In the first question, I, 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 uh, I, uh, there are too many factors actually involved in, 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 in uh, something like a labor stoppage of that size. You know? And uh, you are probably right that actually a lot of uh, immigrants are uh, unable to sustain actually a uh, stoppage economically. You know? It needs savings in a sense. Uh, at the time, I also was an immigrant, and I probably couldn't stop uh, working for very long. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, it is complicated. It was a symbolic uh, uh, reminder to the US at the time. It was imagined in such way. It was not necessarily organized as a labor movement in the traditional uh, thinking of, uh, of, of, of how a union would organize a work stoppage. So I think those are factors, actually, uh, about the, that, that, that answer, or perhaps address the first question that you would mention. You know. And the other one is, I, I have no idea what effects would be and in, during the economic crisis. You know. At that time, the economic crisis was also showing up as an unemployment. And so the issue of labor itself actually uh, changed meaning uh, by 2008. Uh, honestly, I have no idea whether it would have benefited or, or, or hurt, actually, the movement. Uh, it's, a, it's a good, uh, uh, it would be interesting to think about it, yeah. Yes. Uh, which actual uh, changes or modifications do you expect uh, in the near future for the um, immigration reform? Mm -hmm. uh, which would be the um, the actual changes you think that, that can occur this year? Yeah, I, I, I think the changes are going to be none. Uh, the only thing that there is still alive uh, is the, the DREAM Act, uh, which is uh, uh, a bill that uh, benefits um, minors who enter uh, the country uh, under the custody of their parents and as children. And um, I think that's the only one that actually has any shot of passing. The, re the, the, the comprehensive immigration reform is dead, again. Uh, the, uh, imagine if the Tea Party is able to stop the government from functioning, believe me, they will not allow the uh, immigration reform to move, for, move through. Uh, I think the most important changes that we are going to be seeing are at the state level, though. Uh, measures that actually uh, states like California can pass to benefit uh, undocumented immigrants are essential right now for the, uh, for, uh, the uh, immigration reform. So the fact that, uh, that undocumented people can have driver's license in, in California, for instance, is very important. You know? uh, uh, but comprehensive immigration reform at the federal level, I think, is, 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 is not going to happen right now. Thank you. Yes, Rebecca. What do you think about, on the media side, um, the changes that could be taking place that could move this forward? Such as, I'm just thinking right now about the merger of Univision and Disney, ABC relationship. Um, that seems to me to hold a lot of potential for a, a more inclusive dialogue, a more um, uh, just creating more familiarity, less anxiety about mm -hmm. the other, all of that. I just wondered from a media perspective um, how you see us moving forward or backward. That's right, yeah, and I think the, um, the uh, landscape will change. I don't know if that will change radically, but it will definitely be different when Univision is actually putting together, uh, because you know the plan is actually to put together uh, an English language, Latino, uh, 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 nationwide uh, broadcasting channel. You know, um, 
and it's naughty, uh, that plan, you know. It, is, it, it really shows actually how far Latinos had come in the U.S. Uh, that Univision has, has buy-in on, on, on this plan to actually to put together an English language channel. The question will be actually whether actually that channel will provide the same type of public sphere platform that uh, Spanish language radio and television and newspapers have. And right now there is a dislocation, of course, in our political system, you know. We need to participate in majoritarian politics and our public sphere is, however, the one that we have access to is in Spanish. Uh, we typically don't have access to the majoritarian public sphere. Uh, not at the federal level. We have it in cities, we have it in counties, we have it in some states, but at the federal level we don't. So uh, our federal politics are kind of dead in arrival. And uh, so it is, I'm very curious actually about how will Univision work as a, as, a, as a public sphere for Latinos. And uh, it, is, uh, it is of course an issue that uh, is beyond also the uh, uh, willingness to uh, to provide a platform is also the willingness to be an advocate at all, you know, and, and I must remind you that actually Univision is not owned by uh, Latinos, uh, that none of these majoritarian, uh, sorry, none of these minoritarian but huge uh, Spanish language uh, radio networks or television networks uh, are owned by Latinos. 1.5% of Spanish language media is owned by Latinos. So 98.5% is not. Univision is owned by a, a group of investors headed by Jaim Saban uh, uh, and uh, Telemundo, obviously, uh, by NBC, you know, the second largest broadcasting. So they have editorial power as well. And Saban is, is someone who actually donates regularly to Democrats, but he also donates regularly to Republicans, by the way, because uh, he, he's, he's, ta he's a tactician. So, um, but changes are, com are, are, are coming our way, and, 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 and some of us actually will be writing about them, you know. I don't know, I don't know yet how, how, how the U.S. will look with a Latino U.S. language channel, you know, English language channel, yeah. Univision also is, uh, uh, sometimes we forget this, or perhaps you don't, because you do live in a privileged city, LA, you actually are reminded of the power of Latino and Spanish all the time. But most people, when I give talks and when I, I teach in Virginia, okay, my students don't know that Univision, for instance, won sweeps uh, uh, in, in, in August, that it beat all the English language broadcast channels. Uh, they don't recognize the power that uh, Univision has. Telemundo is much smaller, but Univision is so powerful, so powerful. It's a scary, it's a scary monster, by the way. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a scary. I criticize a lot of Univision, by the way, but on this issue, they did, they, they, they did well. Univision supported this. Also, it supported the voting, voting immigration, F, oh, sorry, voting registration efforts of 2008 and 2010 and then 2012. So uh, Univision actually has done well for Latinos, uh, though they are a lot of very problematic overall on these issues, yeah. But in one year, uh, bring me back, and uh, Rebecca, and uh, I'll tell you what will happen with the measure. <laughs> yes? I'm interested in um, if you've thought about the, the recent changes in sort of um, the way other media outlets that are not Univision are now talking about undocumented people. Um, um, because especially like the New York Times, I mean the New York Times or the LA Times now will not use illegal, for example. Um, and, and so there's been a, 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 a switch to, to these more sensitive approaches to, to, to covering um, undocumented issues. Mm -hmm. um, and in California, for example, the, um, I think it's a California endowment is holding, is having a huge sort of um, um, a campaign around undocumented people and their health and, and well-being. So if you see any, if you've seen any sort of changes in the past year or two regarding sort of the, the, the media landscape um, surrounding undocumented issues or... Yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, the irony of course is that actually I think uh, the majority of Americans want uh, comprehensive immigration reform and the culture of uh, politics we have, however, is, 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 is uh, 
balkanize you know and a small minority is, is holding uh, is holding enough power to actually to stop the, the nation from actually moving forward with this but I think actually states are actually moving in the right direction not all of them actually I mean uh, California, you live in California. <laughs> this this crazy state that actually was uh, close to actually passing the uh, ability of non-citizens to serve in jury tri jury trials, you know, uh, which uh, the governor veto uh, on Monday, by the way, won't happen. But he was even proposing that actually was already a radical thing that would, you would never see in the other 49 states. So uh, so things that are happening here are are very Californian and. Uh, and the, uh, there are so many states that are so nativist that every the, the their senate the, at the state level, the senate the house and the governors are actually controlled by uh, by Tea Party nativist forces that actually the the things that we see in California are are dreamlike to us you know when we, when we see California from afar mm -hmm. yeah but that is that is actually. Uh, that is where things can happen at, at the state level, by the way, uh, I believe, uh, because comprehensive federal. Yeah. Yes. Do you think of the role of referendums in California? And uh, it seems often times that the media strongly affects referendum outcomes. Um, and yet, it is one of the more representative forms of democratic practice that we have to the extent that really people actually, each person gets a vote mm -hmm. of those who care to vote. Mm -hmm. So do you think, um, and do you think that there is, um, to what extent, for example, in California, does that minority make sure that um, certain bills stay out, don't become referendums? Because if they did, you know, the, 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 the bill, the vote, the electorate would favor um, passing those those bills. Is there ways in which you know um, people on the top, sort of uh, people in government, or that that minority prevents bills from uh, becoming referendum? Yeah, and um, I think the referendum system is. Um Uh, most nations, that's what they have, by the way. Uh, we have a uh, direct uh, vote democracy where actually a vote is, is a vote. Uh, the U.S. is unusual in the way that we use the Electoral College to actually redefine our political market. Uh, the referendum is a deception where actually, the, uh, as you said, everyone has a right to vote and every vote counts. Um, <laughs> I do have to remind you that the uh, Electoral College was put together in order to have checks and balances so that minorities wouldn't be ruled by majorities. And the problem with referendums is, 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 is potentially that, is that actually we have seen enough uh, negative outcomes for minorities uh, that actually are uh, troublesome. Um, I haven't thought other, uh, a lot about, about it uh, beyond that, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's so particularly Californian, you know, that, um, uh, but I know that in some of the issues that actually affect negatively Latinos, actually, uh, we have lost those referendums, you know, regularly. So um, this will happen, of course, as we actually change demographics in, the, in California. Uh, but again, the checks and balances problem uh, won't be solved. I was surprised that Governor Brown, by the way, was veto the, uh, this legislation passed by the assembly. Uh, any of you have a sense why? Was he pressured by? I mean, he was pressured by the Republicans, of course, but uh, but uh, he came out also very symbolic, saying that you know this serving in jury in juries is is a privilege for citizens. You know, um, I have a big issue with that, of course. It has to be horse trading, though, for, for the license thing. It has, to, it has to be so that it helps get driver's licenses, so that it's not too much at once. So you think that it was, a, it was in a sense, a political negotiation, okay? It's, I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I see, I see. And driver's licenses are probably in the big this picture, is, most important. Right, this important. is a priority, and, and mm -hmm. at the risk, of, in, in order to not risk the driver's license, they would forsake, he would forsake the jury duty. Yeah. 
it makes sense actually. These are the things that we have to do in politics. This is this uh, indeed, yeah. Yes, Chan. Yeah, about eight years ago, we released a brief that was uh, written by one of uh, the early heads of uh, Maldives, mm -hmm. who had actually successfully argued twice before the Supreme Court. And we didn't, the, the brief didn't suggest, it didn't call for anything, but it did point out that through the 19th century, non-citizens did have the ability to participate in local government. Precisely. In Chicago, which is still the case, in Maryland, which is still the case, and also in parts of New York. And that given that there were 18 cities in California where the majority adult population were non-citizens, mm -hmm. that that would be an important movement towards actual representational <coughs> governance at a mm -hmm. local level. So we called to explore that. That led almost immediately to death threats against the chancellor, um, emails, phone calls, faxes, uh, which still existed then, um, <laughs> to us threatening to go to the governor and, and uh, defund the center. Uh -huh. And this was a big surprise because we didn't feel like we'd actually called for a change in governance. We called for exploring for exploration. the implications of this. Do research, yeah. So it's not unusual for Brown not to endorse that, not because of that pressure, mm -hmm. but because the framework of bringing immigrants into a, a, a kind of participation within governance, I think, is a third rail. What has changed, and Gil Cedillo is a, a big factor in this, and it's taken him 10 years, is to begin bringing immigrants into civic life. Uh, and the cornerstone of that has been the driver's license yeah. uh, movement and also um, uh, kind of photo documentation, you know. Uh -huh. So I think it's not inconsistent for him to have done that mm -hmm. and to draw that boundary between where you're actually participating in the governance process and the electoral representation system and where uh, you are participating more broadly within a civic and economic life. So. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it also makes sense because, I mean, the economy like is going to benefit more from having immigrants have driver's license. But it's right. not necessarily going to benefit as much by having them serve jury duty. So they have to pick between the two. They're interested in the extent to which the immigrants keep the California economy going. So it makes a lot more sense to do the driver's license. No, it makes a lot of sense, yeah. What happened to the, uh, and I'm sorry for asking questions instead of answering them right now, <laughs> but another element was actually that uh, non-citizens would have the uh, political right of uh, uh, overseeing uh, polling vo uh, votes. What happened to that one? That one is stay? Which one? Non-citizens would have the right to actually uh, uh, be uh, in, 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 in Working. In, in, in electoral boots, uh, overseeing uh, elections, basically. And that to was work another on polling stations. Pol I that's right, uh, working on polling stations, yeah. And that was another one that actually was controversial, and I don't know what happened. I haven't seen news on that. So, uh, But it is inter this is very Californian again. This is not happening elsewhere, you know. Yeah, things are going south elsewhere, not north. <laughs> Yes. So I just wanted to make one comment that's sort of a, a joke, too. It's um, a couple of years ago, Martin Scorsese made a documentary about Fran Lebowitz. The, she's a satirist. She's a social satirist and a writer. And she was talking about privileged classes of people. And she said, any, any white man that has not become president of the United States should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I draw a finer distinction. I'm not ashamed of myself. I, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think any I think any white man above six feet tall who has not become president should be ashamed of himself. That is the true privileged class. That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Oh yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think. Well, we all know that uh, we do not communicate too well. 
among Latinos. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a fact. Uh, what do you think can help that? Because uh, we are in, in communication, but yet we don't communicate. Mm -hmm. And um, on the other side, we have acculturation, which most people don't have a chance to because of a lack of education and um, they don't speak English. So how do you think we can um, <coughs> better, how, we, how do you think we can better up that situation? with communication and... Uh... Yeah, and there is, um, I don't actually uh, know of research that would, would, would uh, help us in that, in that sense, uh, to think uh, about the issue of how we communicate with each other, you know. Uh, I know that uh, uh, our media system is uh, relatively responsible, uh, responsive to the uh, Latino communities, especially in Spanish. Uh, I know that uh, that the English language media is unresponsive for the most part, and uh, at least it has been so for uh, for a while now. And uh, uh, but in, in the relationship to how we communicate with each other, actually, it's harder for me to actually do pinpoint a, 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 a way of thinking about it. Or um, I think the in, in, in many ways, actually, to thinking about something like that. We have to think about the examples of when things had gone right and when things had gone bad. And I think the marches of 2006, six actually point to the fact that we actually we can communicate quite well and we can organize ourselves quite well. Uh, as to whether we do it regularly or not, it's, it's, it's a different uh, matter, you know. And, and and the political battle of 2006, of course, is its own animal, you know, and and it had. Uh, as much energy as it was possible in a sense. And uh, people like uh, Armando Navarro, a political scientist from UC Riverside, point to the fact that actually that there were weaknesses with the way that the political framework was constructed. That's why it didn't last. Um, the re reality is also that nativists were actually being enfranchised enormously, actually, by mainstream political and media cultures. So, uh, it is not only about our, the way that we communicate to each other, but uh, our ability to out speak those who are uh, also speaking at the same time in that case nativist yeah i don't know if that answers the question but there's a hard one that you asked by the way i wish i could i, I could answer it better mm -hmm. uh, thank you i think that one of the problems is that uh, we don't do too much to mm -hmm. help that situation mm -hmm. uh, there are other uh, minorities or ethnic groups that communicate better and they're more organized they help each other mm -hmm. but for some reason we are a very large group, and uh, we, uh, well, many different countries are included, yeah. and we should become closer, and we should communicate, so that we can really um, overcome all the obstacles that we run into mm -hmm. um, in, in different ways, because we have, we're equipped with different uh, individuals and organizations who can really help and organize our community better. That's what I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and uh, for anything to happen positively for uh, Latinos and for other minority groups, coalitional work is going to be necessary. And coalitional work is very hard to do and very hard to sustain. And that is a problem that everybody has. Um, it is really hard to actually keep going coalitions. Uh, but you are right, actually. That's, uh, that's, that's how we can imagine, actually, political change coming ahead of us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>